Hello and welcome to Business Unmuted Live, a business discussion broadcast live on LinkedIn from Recognition PR Studio and later shared on platforms including YouTube, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. As ever, we're kindly sponsored by Virtue BMW, which is part of Gateshead-based Virtue Motors PLC. So if you're in the market for a new, approved, used or fleet vehicle, stop by one of the dealerships in Stockton, Durham, Sunderland, Moulton or York. Now, today's episode of Business Unmuted is a net zero special. Climate change is very, very prominent and global warming emissions, they're rarely out of the news. The UK has set a challenging target of hitting net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Today, we're joined in the studio by tax partner Deloitte and chair of the Yorkshire Climate Action Coalition, Aaron Taylor. Down the line, we have Jack Kidder, responsible business manager at Henry Boot PLC, a group of companies offering property investment, development and construction services. And join us also is chief executive of Beyond Housing, Rosemary De Rose, with 15,000 properties in the northeastern Yorkshire, Beyond Housing will play an important part in reaching that 2050 target. This week, the IPCC issued a special report on the effects of a 1.5 degree increase in global temperatures, a threshold it says we're likely to reach within 20 years. The report dominated all the papers, even on A-level results day. The UK is committed to be net zero with all emissions to be eliminated or offset by 2050. Business Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng has been making the case that since 1990 emissions have reduced by 45% while the economy has grown by 80%, a world beating figure. In fact, he was recently touring Tees Valley in the northeast, which is fast becoming the renewables and carbon capture capital of our nation. Businesses will perhaps play the most important part in achieving the 2050 target, something I discussed with the UK's net zero business champion, Andrew Griffiths MP. Andrew, thank you for joining us. Can I start by asking you about your role and what the Prime Minister asked you to do when he appointed you? Good afternoon, everybody. and Thank you so much for uh, convening this group, Graham. Um, my role is to, I mean, my higher order role is to show that business is part of the solution or part of the problem. Um, and you'd be surprised, particularly from my perspective as a member of parliament, how many people you know, wanna pile into business and, and just accuse and talk about all the negative things. So the key thing, and that's obviously not my view and it's not the prime minister's view. And in fact, we're only gonna solve the climate crisis by the brilliant problem solving power of business. So my role is ultimately to show and generate the proof points that make that case. P and I talked to him at a, a special conference call for businesses around the north of England organised by Deloitte. And it was very interesting as well. Now, before we get into all that, uh, first I'd like to talk to Jack from Henry Boot. Uh, I'll turn to Henry Boot first because it's launched its first net zero carbon framework. I've got a copy here. Now, Jack, what is this uh, framework and, and what's it all about? So effectively, the framework is our plan to reach net zero carbon um, by 2030. Um, and being really honest, for us as a business operating in real estate, real estate in a built environment, you know, we've been environmentally minded for, for a long time. But I think we, like lots of other businesses, have noticed and, and are responding to the, the need for increased ambition. And, you know, we all recognise that, you know, as you've said from the IPCC report this week, um, you, you know, to, to tackle climate change requires real ambition. It requires collaboration. And I, and I think it requires us all to really step up and, and put our shoulder to the wheel for for, for doing more on, on what we can all do as businesses. So our net zero carbon framework is, is all about how we do that across the group of companies at Henry Boo and how we respond to the, the challenges in, in our market. But actually how we don't just look at this as a risk and, and a challenge, but actually how do you create a really exciting opportunity for adapting our business and supporting our clients um, as we do that. Henry Boot has massive properties, industrial properties all around uh, England and, and around the country. How, what practical effects are you able to take? I think ultimately, you know, when, when you look at the road to net zero carbon and climate change, it, it can become inc incredibly complex. And I think the way the way we've attempted to tackle that is to break it down in, into different segments effectively. And, and primarily uh, between now and 2030, we're, we're really looking to target 
um, our direct control emissions, so what, what we can directly control. <clears throat> but what we are very, very conscious of is that actually you can't ignore those emissions that are indirectly caused, and that can be everything from staff commuting to the materials you use when you're building. Now, although that's more complex and, and is, a, is a longer term challenge, we are looking at how we can t- you know, tackle that from, from day one. But I think the, the, I suppose the lessons I've learned is that with such a big challenge, it needs to be broken down into bite-sized chunks and you need to set yourself targets that are achievable. So for us, it's about marrying that ambition and, and really pushing ourselves to, to reach stretching targets, but doing it in a way that's manageable for everybody to understand what their role to play is. Now, you started by evaluating where your baseline was. Uh, And I think it was 2019. You didn't go for a baseline during the lockdown, which might have been a bit easier. You went for 2019. So how are you going to measure against that? So we we worked with a a consultancy called Amphesis, uh, who are specialists in in, in this sector. And and they were brilliant, actually, in helping us really build up a full understanding of our our, our, our baseline from 2019. And and as you said, we didn't go with 2020, because obviously that was a a bit of an anomaly with, with COVID having an impact. But effectively, what, what we needed to understand was where, where are we starting from? What was business as usual? And the way we intend to uh, to tackle the issue is basically we've, we've set ourselves our kind of long-term target, which is for 2030. But we want to be reporting back on an annual basis how we're decarbonising. Um, and, and you know, as, as we look to grow our business, how we reduce our carbon footprint. So I think it's about sharing regular updates both to the market, but also to our own people so they can see that progress has been made. Um, and, and looking to do that across a number of areas, whether it's electrification of vehicles, whether it's um, looking at how we're you know, making positive changes to our, our property. There's, there's various things you can update people on, but I think it's about regular communication and, and progress against those targets. Okay, well, Jack, we'll come back to you later in the discussion. Rosemary, let's let's turn to you from Beyond Housing. All those houses occupied by the general public and, and people who have housing expenses to meet. And, and But let's start with what you've said to your investors, what you've said to people who are going to put money into Beyond Housing. You went for a uh, bond of £250 million, an environmental bond, effectively. What did it mean and how would you spend the money? Um, sustainability for us um, is really, really important as an organisation moving forward. And in financing the business, we wanted to show to potential investors that we had um, a framework there that said we were deadly serious about making our business more sustainable and supporting those um, overarching um, UN sustainable goals. So we um, went for the bond issuance um, as a result of saying, um, this is what we intend to do to meet those goals. Um, Refinancing um, to that extent was about really supporting um, all of the work that we need to do in the 15,000 homes that we have when it comes to things like retrofitting them to make them more energy efficient and uh, improve the performance of that energy efficiency overall. But it's also about making sure that anything we do from here on in, particularly in terms of building new homes, um, we are doing the very best we can in terms of um, reducing those emissions and getting them to carbon zero as quickly as we possibly can. So I think one of the things that came out of the IPCC report this week was about the fact that methane is one of those contributors or major contributors um, to emissions. And we intend that all of our new homes from 2024, 25 uh, will be um, coming off gas, for example, in order to reduce those emissions. Well, and that... then you look at what we will do moving forward with some of our retrofit programmes. Um, that is quite a major investment in terms of um, making them more energy um, efficient, um, making them warmer, reducing fuel poverty, um, and ensuring that sort of um, they become more sustainable generally over um, that longer period of time that Jack referred to, because it is about bite-sized chunks, and we will do that between now and 2050. Um, and we have those bite-sized chunks in place in order to do that. 
Um, okay, but well, we let's unpack some of it then, uh, Rosemary, because you, the, the, the answer you've given, which is very detailed, is, is about two bits. There's existing homes and retrofitting, and I, I saw that you, you put a million pounds into windows in Grangetown in, yes. uh, and, and so on, and then you've got the new homes. Let's talk about the retrofitting first. If, if I was sitting at home as one of your tenants in a, in a home that I was perfectly happy with, and your policy is now to retrofit it, what is the benefit to me to have the disruption that would involve? Well, I think it's, a, it's going to be a major challenge for individuals generally, wherever they live. And it's not just the people who live in beyond housing homes, it's people like you and me. We've got to also consider what we can do individually to um, make our homes more sustainable. So we'll be working very closely with our customers and our tenants to, under, to help them understand what's needed. And some of those are already engaged with us to a very great extent in terms of them wanting to make their homes more energy efficient and more sustainable. And obviously there is going to be some disruption um, to um, customers in making those retrofits happen. We're a long way off that. What we have, though, is what we call a low regret strategy, which means anything that we do to maintain those homes moving forward is not going to contribute any further to negative emissions. Right. What we're doing is wherever we invest, we are saying that what will happen is it will improve the situation for them moving forward improve the energy efficiency, improve the sustainability, and then when any major retrofits come along, hopefully we've got less to do. It sounds very much like you're going to be ahead of the government's target, because the government has actually said 2025, there's a hard target for carbon neutral new homes, and you said you'd be there, but you might even be getting there or thereabouts on the existing ones. Well, making sure that sort of we come off gas by that point in time for new homes, making sure that um, we, we've we got a target of 50% of all new homes um, will be carbon neutral by 2030. So ultimately, we're not completely there in, in total, but we just say everything we do, if we can set those bite-sized junks, like Jack says, then we're moving towards it. Um, and hopefully we will see um, the industry and the types of components that are coming along support that moving forward as well because some of the things that we need today are just not there or they're just not cost efficient at the moment okay. so hopefully by the time we move five or ten years hence we'll be able to have um, uh, improved components and uh, improved ways of actually doing those types of retrofit. We'll come back to you in a minute particularly on the question on gas and so on. Let's talk to Aaron now you as well as being a, a, a tax partner at Deloitte which sounds a bit dry <laughs> but Deloitte are really quite into this aren't they uh, as an advisory firm there are audits to do on this kind of stuff aren't there? Uh, Absolutely, Graham. Yeah, without a doubt, this is an area where we can bring our expertise to bear, whether that's from a sort of a consulting perspective, right from some of that baselining that you described, understanding the risks, the opportunities, and then really sort of operationalizing it through to ultimately reporting it. And some of the stuff that you might know is a bit more for that kind of assurance. And um, but it but it is the whole journey for us, as well as and, and I, I think um, this is why I personally got so involved was that sort of convening power that we have as a business and our business relationships, which is where the Climate Action Coalition was actually born. Right, Climate Action Coalition in just a moment, but mm. before we do, tell us about the learning uh, <laughs> rule for new and existing employees at Deloitte. You've got a, a golden rule that people have to learn about this stuff. We, we do, yeah, and, and I think, and this is actually something that Jack and I have spoken about quite a lot, is that, is that you talk about how do you bring to life um, this whole question of, of carbon and the race to net zero, and making bold statements and bold ambitions and commitments as a business is only one piece of it. You're only going to get there if you actually drive this through your business and embed it into the culture so we all have got to understand climate and what it means in our business activities. So that starts with learning. And uh, we're not just talking about our junior staff, that starts with our partners actually, and that's probably where we have started. And, and, and every day is definitely a school day when it comes to this area. 
Let's talk about convening. You've got mm. the Climate Change Action Coalition, which you discussed, and the clip of the, the uh, special Prime Minister's special mm -hmm. envoy uh, was something that was done by that coalition, and you pulled them together to listen to what he had to say, and also tell him stuff, I might add. <laughs> What's the progress been of this coalition? Uh, well, I'm, I'm tremendously proud, but it was born out of the idea that this is huge, it is challenging, and that as businesses, we can be, I agree with the statement that we can be the positive power for good, and that we can drive some of that change through, and that actually there's a great commercial opportunity in the jobs that we can create um, and, and hopefully export in the future from the whole net zero economy. We can win as, as a country as, and as a region. Um, but it's very difficult to solve those big things on your own. And, um, and therefore, uh, we were working alongside our friends, Walker Morris, the law firm, and the University of Leeds. And we came up with this idea together that what happens if we used our collective convening power to bring together businesses in the region to share knowledge, share challenges, and hopefully in the future work together on some of those, on solving, the, uh, solving those. Jack, are you a member of this coalition? Do you get involved? Yes, we are. Yeah, so we we've been involved since since late last year, um, and I've got nothing but positive things to say. I, I totally agree with Aaron. I think net zero carbon is a, is a significant problem, but it, it's one that's universal to us all. And actually, what's been brilliant about the coalition is that regardless of whether you're in the same sector or even if you're on the same scale uh, of company, there's things you can learn from each other. And we, we discuss a very uh, wide range of topics, but what's really helpful is that actually we're all trying to tackle very similar problems. And it's great to have a forum to share knowledge and, and share solutions. Look, the, the four people on this discussion are all very committed to this policy of net zero. In fact, the government's policy is, is also to make it cuts by 78% mm -hmm. by 2035. So there's net zero and a stepping stone to net zero. Mm -hmm. But it, it would be wrong not to challenge it a little because Regular people who pay bills may fear that there is a consequence to this. Uh, the Daily Express had a poll that 70% of people do not want to change their gas boiler. The cost of a home could increase by the measures that Rosemary might be outlining. Uh, the cost of a car, certainly electric cars, are considerably mm -hmm. co more uh, costly to purchase. Um, and the cost of energy, despite the fact that the wind is free, it, putting the wind turbines in and laying the pipes and the, the wires is expensive and energy costs aren't coming down anytime soon. So is there any tangible benefit beyond making ourselves feel good for the man and woman in the street? Aaron? Well, I, I think that actually an, uh, if we think about the power of business, um, we're not just there we, we, to serve our sort of uh, communities and our customers. But actually, we are generally collections of people. And actually, all of our employees are, are those man and lady on the street who, who feel those same things. And so one of the areas, actually, that we have discussed quite uh, regularly as a coalition and are looking at in more depth is how can we use our employee-employer relationship to drive some of those positive behaviours and make it easier for people to make positive choices that is win-win for them. And actually, you know, for example, you know, uh, employee EV vehicle schemes, the, the tax side, I will slip into tax mode here, mm. it is incredibly um, uh, generous in terms of the tax uh, breaks available to take an electric vehicle that does make it affordable, for example. So we as employers can make these things more accessible to our employees and our employees are telling us that that's what they want to choose. Uh, um, that's how I, I can testify that <laughs> myself. I, we have a very small fleet of vehicles mm -hmm. and every member of staff has requested a, uh, a company car to be EV, the result mm -hmm. being £1,500, £2,000 better off mm -hmm. a year. Uh, it's a sort of climate change pay rise in that case. Very good point. And I suppose um, when you see the climate itself and the way it interacts with people, the extreme weather events whether it be flooding in England or fires in Greece, uh, do affect everyone. It just makes it real, doesn't it, for all yeah. of us. I don't think any of us could debate at any point over the last uh, few weeks the way that the news has come in. Um, it, it is beyond doubt, and I think it brings it home very, very quickly to all of us. 
and it, it makes it non-negotiable. I think that these, these are things that we all have got a responsibility, but I believe that as business we have a greater responsibility given that we can um, cre create more action collectively than any one individual can do on their own. Let's just talk about some choices. Uh, R Rosemary, Rosie, let's talk about, you mentioned the new houses you build will not be powered by gas. Have you made choices yet on the technology you will go? Because there are new technologies and you might, not that you would, but you might make the wrong choice, going with air source when maybe hydrogen's down the way. Yeah, and I think they are decisions that we need to make. Um, and ultimately, I think sort of um, that's where the collective and the group thinking and the operating at scale can benefit us all. So yes, I do think we need to make sure that we don't disadvantage people and particularly those people who are vulnerable, who are on low incomes. I really do think it is a balance between saying sort of some of the things we're suggesting here that can make homes more energy efficient and at the same time and create better sustainability, lower emissions, et cetera, are possible. Um, and some of the things we were talking about, about phasing it are really important because that new emerging technology is changing all the time. Mm -hmm. So um, we do have to tread carefully, but that collective approach means that we should be able to get the very best of both worlds. I think similar um, to what Aaron said, you know, wake up call, code red for humanity um it's non-negotiable you know i get quite frightened when i see the the consequences if we do nothing i you know as a collective we have this within our gift to do something and do it right um and the way that we can do that is to make sure that we 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 tread carefully but we 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 make sure that we stay ahead of the curve when it comes to those emerging technologies so no we haven't decided and we may do a bit of everything yes up to 2030 and 2050 um, but we will have to sort of continue to stay. I mean you have houses I've seen them I've driven through a red car where you you've got lots of houses that have solar panels on the roof automatically now don't yeah, you so. Yeah and look, and look where that's come from over the last sort of decade you know quite considerable change in terms of that um, um, move. Uh, and, and back to you Jack I might give you the last word actually what about choices can you point to that Henry Boot has made in terms of technology just as practical as that I mean you've got a lot of construction equipment J, J, uh, JCB is talking about hydrogen engines uh, mm. because it's difficult to electrify construction equipment um, uh, absolutely. what kind of choices you know, are you I, looking at making well I, I totally agree with Rosemary and I think it's the same for us and I think it's the same for lots of businesses which is that you know obviously adapting to become net zero carbon does require significant investment and it's about it's about making the choice at the right time so there are things we can do very quickly we can retrofit offices with additional materials we can uh, look at electrifying elements of our fleet and then there are elements that will take longer and i, and I think what businesses need to do is, is look at this as a, a long-term issue but, but at the same time don't delay action we, we need to act now we need to act quickly but you know, it's good to have a long-term plan. This is not a problem we can fix overnight. So it's, I, I think for us, it's again, it's about marrying that ambition, but making sure that we do it in a, a sustainable, strategic way. And, and again, just to kind of you know, give the plugs to the coalition because I think it really deserves it. These are issues when you talk about in a group. It's very helpful to see what other people are doing, and we can share experiences. And, and going back to Rosemary's point, that's that's where you can are able to make more informed decisions. Well, Jack from Henry Boot, uh, Rosie from Beyond Housing and Aaron from Deloitte, thank you very much. And that's it for this edition of Business Unmuted. Thank you for joining us.